In this video, I want to talk about post-transcriptional modification. So these are ways in which the RNA that's been transcribed is modified in some way. So in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, they both have their RNA and tRNAs processed in a certain way, and actually in pretty much the same way. Both the rRNA and the tRNA are cut and trimmed. Essentially, the initial transcripts are a little bit too big, and so in certain regions, they're cut around and trimmed to be a little bit shorter. No details really are associated with that. At least, I'm not going to talk about them. The tRNAs have a further modification. There is an addition of a CCA at the 3' prime end. So you add two cytosines and an adenine at the 3' prime end. So if this is a tRNA, we're going to be adding a C, a C, and an A here at the 3' prime end of a tRNA. And what's the reason for that? This CCA is important because it is the attachment site of amino acids that are going to be incorporated in translation. So amino acids will actually attach to the CCA end right here. So there will be an amino acid attached there. And the tRNA will bring it to the ribosome for translation. But we'll talk more about that later. Now eukaryotes have their mRNA modified. Prokaryotes don't. So I'm going to talk about the eukaryotic mRNA modifications. The first one is the 5' prime cap. And the 5' prime cap is a 7-methyl guanosine cap. And it's attached via a 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate linkage. What does any of that mean? Well, the 5' prime indicates that if we have a particular strand of mRNA, the 5' prime end is going to be capped in some way. That cap is a 7-methylguanosine. And it's connected via 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate linkage. So what does that look like? Well, if you imagine this to be the mRNA, we have the ribose and a base. Uh, connect. This is the sugar phosphate backbone here. Sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, blah, 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 blah. And these are the bases over here. So if this is the 5' prime end, right? The, these phosphates are attached to the 5' prime end. So if this is the 5' prime end of a particular strand, what are we going to have? Well, this here, this portion here, let me actually outline it, is the 7-methylguanosine cap right here. Okay? So why is it called a 7-methylguanosine? Well, this portion this is a ribose with a guanine attached to it. So that's the guanosine portion. Why is it called 7-methyl? Well, because if you count, if you go through a number, the purine, this is this here, this nitrogen is uh, atom number seven. So that seventh member of the rings um, has a, a methyl attached to it. So it's a seven methyl guanosine. And it's attached to the mRNA strand via a five prime to five prime triphosphate linkage. So this ribose is phosphate groups, or this uh, nucleotide, or this guanosine is attached to this ribose, right, with a five prime phosphate attached to this five prime phosphate. So, and there's three of these phosphates here. So that is a 5' prime to 5' prime linkage, and there are three phosphates. What is the purpose of this 5' prime cap? Well, it does a few things. First is that it aids in transport from the nucleus to the cytoplasm or the cytosol. That's important, right? Because in eukaryotes, transcription occurs in the nucleus. Another thing that it does is that it protects the 5' prime end from degradation by nucleases. If you recall, nucleases break down nucleic acids. So um, any exonucleases that want to act on this end here uh, won't be able to because of this 5' prime cap. Another thing that it does is that it promotes the binding of the, MR, of M, the mRNA transcript to the ribosome for translation. So the mRNA needs to be translated, right? That's the purpose of mRNA. So it needs to be translated on a ribosome. Well, it needs to somehow bind the ribosome. So this 5', prime cap, helps, five prime cap helps it do that. Another modification is a 3', prime, let me actually write it in blue, a 3' prime 
poly A tail. So a poly, um, lots of adenines are attached to the three prime end. So it's a poly A tail, and it's attached by poly adenylate polymerase. That makes sense. It's just, it's the thing that adds a bunch of A's on it. So if this is a five prime end of an mRNA, and this is the three prime end, we add a bunch of adenine nucleotides, or the number, the the letter N here to represent a certain number of nucleotides being added. Well, what's the poor purpose of this three prime poly A tail? Essentially, it protects the three prime end from degradation. Oops, that's messy. <laughs> from degradation. And usually there are about like a hundred to three hundred A's that are added to that three prime end. The third modification to mRNA and eukaryotes is splicing. The mRNA transcripts are spliced. This is carried out with this thing called the spliceosome. Spliceosome, which contains these things called SNRPs, S N. R N P SNRPs. Okay, that's a funny name. I actually enjoy saying it. SNRPs. That stands for small nuclear RNAs and proteins. So when splicing occurs, there's this thing called a lariat structure that's formed, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like in just a second. But what's happening in splicing is that there are these things called introns and there are these things called exons. So introns are intruders. So what happens to them is they are cut out. Don't let that confuse you. Exons are exceptional, right? They're the exceptions. Oops. Oh, I could just write exception, exceptions, or exceptional, however you want to remember it. But these exons, they stay in. So the introns are spliced out, the exons stay in. How does that actually happen? Well, if we have, for instance, uh, a, a pre-mRNA or an immature M mRNA with exon number one here and then some intron and then exon number two. On these introns, there are these certain branch points. Now, what these branch points are involved in is the formation of a lariat, the lariat structure that I'm about to show you. So, this branch point, what happens is it's 2 prime OH, right, on the ribose ring uh, of a certain nucleotide over here, is going to go over and nucleophilically attack here at, at the... Um, it's going to attack uh, the nucleotide over here on the intron that's attached to exon number one. And when it does that, it bonds to itself. And that's what this is. It kind of loops around, forms this little... I actually probably shouldn't have drawn that arrow in that color so as to not be confusing. Let me draw it like this in, in blue. So it binds there, and it forms... It kind of loops around like this and binds itself at that branch point. So that branch point here is right there. Then exon number one now has a free three prime OH group. Now what happens to that is that three prime OH group goes ahead and it nucleophilically attacks here at the exon to cause this lariat. So let me actually label that this lariat structure of the intron to to break off, and then the exon one gets to connect to exon two. So what happens is the exon number one and exon number two become connected, and then this lariat structure dissociates away. So now we went from a pre-mRNA or immature RNA to a spliced and mature mRNA. So that's how splicing works. Now, maybe you thought about this earlier, but why don't prokaryotes have post-transcriptional modifications of mRNA? Well, to answer to that, we have to answer these questions here. So, do prokaryotes have a nucleus? No. Do eukaryotes have a nucleus? Yes. Now, where does transcription occur in each of these types of cells, or each of these classes? In prokaryotes, transcription occurs in the cytosol. 
And the reason why is because prokaryotes do not have any membrane-bound organelles. They don't have a nucleus. In eukaryotes, transcription does occur in the nucleus. Now, where does translation occur? Translation occurs in the cytosol. In both of them, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, by default, really, because they have no place other than the cytosol for uh, things to happen. In eukaryotes, translation occurs in the cytosol, and transcription occurs in the nucleus. Now, why is this important? Because in prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we have to think about what about the timing of transcription and translation? Well, in prokaryotes, transcription occurs in the cytosol, and translation occurs in the cytosol. So as soon as an mRNA is transcribed, the ribosomes in the cytosol can hop right on and begin translating away. So the timing in prokaryotes is at the same time. So essentially what's going on, it's actually a little bit messy, sorry about that, at the same time. So the mRNA doesn't have a chance to get modified. It doesn't have time to get modified. Because as soon as it's transcribed, it begins to be translated because the ribosomes are in the cytosol. In eukaryotes, however, it's a little bit different. The transcription occurs in the nucleus, so the mRNA is made in the nucleus, and it has to leave the nucleus to go to the cytosol and then be translated. So here, they're at different times. Because the mRNA has to leave the nucleus through the nuclear pores and then enter into the cytosol. So then translation can occur. So because um, the, the, the mRNA is sort of separated from the cytosol by the nuclear membrane, here there is time for modifications, essentially. So that subtle difference of, you know, the presence or, or lack thereof of a nucleus is important in answering this question here. And I hope that made sense. I hope this video was helpful in understanding these topics. One last thing, I am a tutor. If you live in Southern California, feel free to contact me via email at moofuniversity at gmail.com. See the description below for more details. Thank you for watching.